On power. Its nature and the history of its growth. Bertrand de Juvenel. 1949. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Book 1. Metaphysics of Power. Chapter 1. Of Civil Obedience. 1. The Mystery of Civil Obedience. 2. The Historical Character of Obedience. 3. Statics and Dynamics of Obedience. 4. Obedience Linked to Credit. After describing in his lost treatises on constitutions the various governmental structures of a large number of different societies, Aristotle, in the politics, reduced them all to three basic types, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. The characteristics of these three types, in the various mixtures in which they were found in practice, accounted for all the forms of power which had come under his observation. Ever since then political science, or what passes for such, has followed obediently in the footsteps of the master. The discussion of the different forms of power is always with us because, there being in every society a center of control, everyone is naturally interested in the questions of its powers, its organization, and its conduct. There is, however, another phenomenon that also deserves some consideration, the fact that over every human community there reigns a government at all. The differences between forms of government in different societies and the changes of form within the same society are but the accidents, to borrow the terminology of philosophy, of the same essence. The essence is power. And we may well break off from inquiring into what is the best form of power, from political ethics, to ask what is the essence of power, to construct a political metaphysic. The problem may also be looked at from another angle, which permits of a simpler statement of it. At all times and in all places we are confronted with the phenomenon of civil obedience. An order issued by power gets obeyed by the community at large. When power addresses itself to a foreign state, the weight behind its words is in proportion to its own ability to make itself obeyed and win from that obedience the means of action. It all turns on that obedience. Who knows the reasons for that obedience knows the inner nature of power. Another point is that, as history shows, obedience has certain limits within which power must keep, just as there is a limit to the amount of a society's resources which it can take for its own. These limits, as observation shows us, do not remain static throughout the history of a society. For example, the Capetian kings could not impose direct taxation, and the Bourbons could not exact military service. The fraction or quantum of a society's resources which power can take for its own is theoretically measurable. Clearly it is strictly proportioned to the quantum of obedience. And these variations in the resources available to power are the measure of its own extent. We are safe in saying that the more completely power can control the actions of the members of society and turn their resources to its uses, the greater is power's extent. The study of the successive variations in its resources is to consider the history of power by reference to its extent, a very different thing from the history usually written of it, by reference to its forms. These variations in the extent of power, considered as a function of the age of a society, could be represented in the form of a graph. Will the curve run in capricious indentations, or will its general direction be sufficiently defined to enable us to speak of power being subject to a law of development in the society in question? Taking the latter hypothesis to be true, and also taking the view that human history, in so far as it has come down to us, is but the arrangement in their order of the successive histories of big societies or civilizations, into the formation of which smaller ones have gone, all carried forward on the same impulse, then we may easily conceive that the curves of power in all these big societies will probably show a certain similarity to each other and that to examine them may throw some light on the course taken by civilizations. The start of our inquiry will be an attempt to penetrate to the essence of power. It may be that we shall not succeed in it, nor is success absolutely necessary to our purpose, for what we are really after is the relation, to put it broadly, of power to society, the former being considered as a function of the latter. And these two we can regard, if we have to, as unknown variables of which nothing can be grasped but the relationship between them. But history, when all is said, cannot be reduced in this way to an affair of mathematics. And we must not neglect whatever aids our vision. 1. The Mystery of Civil Obedience The high school of our species, curiosity, requires the unusual for its awakening. Just as it took prodigies, eclipses, or comets, to start our distant ancestors inquiring into the structure of the universe, so in our time crises have been needed for the birth of an economic science, and 30 millions of unemployed for it to become widespread. If they happen every day, then the most surprising events do not act on our intelligences. Hence it is, no doubt, that so little thought has been given to the amazing faculty for obedience of groupings of men, whether numbering thousands or millions, which causes them to obey the rules and orders of a few.
it needs only an order for the tumultuous flood of vehicles which throughout a vast country kept to the left to change sides and keep to the right. It needs only an order for an entire people to quit their fields, their workshops, and their offices, and flock to barracks. Discipline on such a scale as this, said Necker, must astound any man who is capable of reflection. This obedience on the part of a very large number to a very small one is a thing singular to observe and mysterious to think on. To Rousseau the spectacle of power recalls Archimedes sitting calmly on the shore and effortlessly launching a large ship. Anyone who has ever started a small society for some special object knows well the propensity of its members, even though they have entered of their own accord into a voluntary engagement for a purpose to which they attach importance, to leave the society in the lurch. We may, then, well feel surprise at the docility of men in their dealings with a large society. Someone says, come, and come we do. Someone says, go, and go we do. We give obedience to the tax gatherer, to the policeman, and to the sergeant major. As it is certain that it is not before them that we bow down, it must be before the men above them, even though, as often happens, we despise their characters and suspect their designs. What, then, is the nature of their authority over us? Is it because they have at their disposal the means of physical coercion and are stronger than ourselves that we yield to them? It is true that we go in fear of a compulsion which they can apply to us. But to apply it they must have the help of a veritable army of underlings. We have still to explain where they get this army and what secures them their fidelity, in that aspect power appears to us in the guise of a small society commanding a larger. It is, however, far from being the case that power has always had at its disposal a vast apparatus of coercion. Rome, for instance, as it was for many centuries, had no permanent officials, no standing army set foot inside its walls, and its magistrates had but a few lictors to do their will. The only force of which power then disposed to restrain an individual member of the community was what it drew from the community as a whole. Would it, then, be true to say that power owes its efficaciousness to feelings, not of fear, but of partnership? That a group of human beings has a collective mind, a national genius, and a general will? And that its government is the personification of the group, the public expression of its mind, the embodiment of its genius, and the promulgation of its will? So that the mystery of obedience dissolves beneath the fact that we are in reality only obeying ourselves? That has been the explanation favored by our men of law, its vogue has been assisted both by the double meaning of the word state and by its conformity with certain usages of our day. The expression state comprises two very different meanings. First, it denotes any organized society with an autonomous government, in that sense we are all members of a state and we are the state. But the word also means the governmental machine in that society. In that sense the members of a state are those with a share of power and they are the state. The proposition that the state, meaning thereby the governmental machine, rules a society is nothing more than a truism, but once injects surreptitiously its other meaning into the word state, and the proposition becomes the quite unproven one that the society is ruling itself. What we have here is, clearly, a piece of unconscious self-deception. The reason why it is not too flagrant for concealment is that in the society of our day the governmental machine is, or should be in principle, the expression of society, a mere conduit, in other words, by means of which society rules itself. Even if we choose to assume what in fact remains to be seen, that that is now the true position, it is clear that it has not been, always and everywhere, the true position in the past, but that authority has at times been exercised by powers which were quite distinct entities from society, and yet received obedience. Therefore the rule of power over society is not the work of force alone, because it is met with even where the force available is very small, nor is it the work of partnership alone, because it is met with even where society has absolutely no part in power. It may be urged that there are really two powers which are different in kind, that one is the power of a small number of men over the mass, as in a monarchy or aristocracy, and that power of this kind maintains itself by force alone, and that the other is the power of the mass over itself, and that power of this kind maintains itself by partnership alone. If that were so, we should expect to find that in monarchical and aristocratic regimes the apparatus of coercion was at its zenith, because there was no other driving power, and that in modern democracies it was at its nadir, because the demands made by them on their citizens are all the decisions of the citizens themselves. Whereas what we in fact find is the very opposite, and that there goes with the movement away from monarchy to democracy an amazing development of the apparatus of coercion. No absolute monarch ever had at his disposal a police force comparable to those of modern democracies. It is, therefore, a gross mistake to speak of two powers differing in kind, each of which receives obedience through the play of one feeling only. Logical analyses of this kind misconceive the complexity of the problem. 2. The historical character of obedience. 
obedience is, in truth, the outcome of various and very different feelings which have, as it were, the effect of seating power on a multiple throne. Power exists, it has been said, only through the concurrence of all the properties which go to form its essence, it draws its inner strength and the material succor which it receives, both from the continuously helping hand of habit and also from the imagination, it must possess both a reasonable authority and a magical influence, it must operate like nature herself, both by visible means and by hidden influence. This is a useful formula, so long as it is not regarded as a systematic and exhaustive catalogue. It stresses the ascendancy of the irrational factors, and it is far from being the case that obedience is mainly due either to a weighing of the risks of disobedience or to a conscious identification by the subject of his will with that of his governors. The essential reason for obedience is that it has become a habit of the species. We find power at the birth of social life, just as we find a father at the birth of physical life. This simile has constantly given rise in the past to comparisons between them, and will no doubt, even in the teeth of the most conclusive objections, continue to give rise to them. Power is for us a fact of nature. From the earliest days of recorded history it has always presided over human destinies. And so its authority in our own time finds support in us from feelings drawn from very ancient times, feelings which it has with each successive change of form successively inspired. The continuity of human development has been such that most, if not all, of the great institutions which still form the framework of civilized society have their roots in savagery, and have been handed down to us in these later days through countless generations, assuming new outward forms in the process of transmission, but remaining in their inmost core substantially unchanged. All societies, even those which seem to us the least developed, go back into a past of several thousand years, and the authorities which ruled them in former times did not disappear without bequeathing to their successors their prestige, nor without leaving in men's minds imprints which are cumulative in their effect. The succession of governments which, in the course of centuries, rule the same society may be looked on as one underlying government which takes on continuous accretions. And for that reason power is something which the historian, rather than the logician, comprehends. So that we may unhesitatingly disregard the various systematic approaches which claim to gather all its diverse attributes into a single principle, and to make of that principle both the foundation of all the rights exercised by powers titularies and in the explanation of all the obligations which they impose on others. Sometimes this single principle is the divine will of which the titularies are the vicars on earth, sometimes it is the general will of which they are the mandatories, sometimes again it is the national genius of which they are the incarnation, or the collective conscience which they interpret, or the finalization of society of which they are the agents. Clearly we cannot make of any one of the aforesaid principles the only begetter of power, if there ever was a power in being which lacked the backing of the particular principle. But we know that powers have existed in periods in which it would have been nonsense to talk of national genius, other powers there were which there was no general will to sustain, far from it. The one systematic approach which can be made to fulfill the fundamental condition of explaining every power whatsoever is that by way of the divine will, when St. Paul said, there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God, even Nero's, he provided theologians with the explanation of power which includes its every instance. All other metaphysical explanations of power are useless for the purpose, if indeed they can be called metaphysics at all. For we leave the region of true metaphysics when analysis is more or less completely submerged by ethics, when the question asked is, not what must power be to exist? But what must power be to be good? 3. Statics and Dynamics of Obedience Should we, then, ignore these theories? Certainly not, for these ideal representations of power have given currency in society to beliefs which play a vital part in actual power's development. We may study the movements of celestial bodies without concerning ourselves with astronomers' concepts which, though they were once believed, do not correspond to the reality. This is so because the movements themselves are unaffected by our beliefs about them. But the position is quite different when it comes to the ideas conceived at different times of power, for government, being a human, and not a natural, phenomenon, is deeply influenced by the ideas men have of it. And it is true to say that power expands under cover of the beliefs entertained about it. With this in mind, let us take up again our musings on obedience. The proximate cause of obedience is, as we have seen, habit. But let command once step outside its usual limits and habit ceases to be a full explanation of obedience. When it is command's will to impose on men obligations in excess of those to which they have been broken in, it no longer gets the benefit of the automatic reactions which time has implanted in the commanded. To bring into being the enlarged effect, which is in this case an accretion of obedience, there must be an enlarged cause. At this point habit is not enough, there must be recourse to reason. Both logic and history lead to this conclusion, 
that it is in times when power is stretching its limbs that discussion takes place of its inner nature and of the elements inherent in it which bring it obedience, and this is so whether its growth is in the end helped or hindered by the process of discussion. The opportunism which is thus seen to characterize the various theories of power is but one more proof of the inability of such theories to provide a complete explanation of the phenomenon. Whenever a period of discussion arrives, reason has never failed to follow the same two paths, which correspond to the theoretical and the practical sides of the human intellect. On the side of theory it has sought to justify obedience as such, on the side of practice it has opened the door to beliefs, whether in efficient or final causes matters not, which make an increase of obedience possible. Power, in other words, must be obeyed, whether in virtue of its nature or of its aims. The arguments from its nature are based on the rise of theories of sovereignty. The efficient cause of obedience, run these theories, is to be found in a prerogative exercised by power in virtue of a certain majestas, of which it is either the possessor or the incarnation or the representative. This prerogative belongs to it on the one necessary and sufficient condition that it is legitimate, in virtue, in other words, of its origin. The arguments from its aims are based on the rise of theories as to the purpose of government. The final cause of obedience, run these theories, lies in the end of power, and that end is the common good, however the term is interpreted. Power has earned the subject's submissiveness when it seeks and gets the common good, no other justification for it is required. This simple classification includes all the standard theories of power. In general, no doubt, powers lay claim to both the efficient cause and the final cause at one and the same time, but it will tend to much greater clarity to consider successively the attributes first of the one and then of the other. But, before going into any detail, let us stop to see whether we cannot, in the light of this general survey, form even now some approximate idea of power. We have found in it, through all its outward manifestations, the mysterious quality of its continuing essence, and this quality confers on it an irrational influence which cannot be brought to the bar of logical reason. Reason discerns in it three settled qualities, force, legitimacy, beneficence. But try to isolate these qualities, and, as with some chemical bodies, they steal away into thin air. And this they do because they exist, not absolutely, but only in the minds of men. What for practical purposes exists is human belief in the legitimacy of power, hope of its beneficence, consciousness of its strength. But, quite clearly, it wins its title to be legitimate only by conforming to what is in the general view the legitimate form of power, it wins its title to be beneficent only by making its ends conform to those which men in general esteem. Lastly, its only strength is at any rate in most cases, the strength which men think it their duty to lend to it. 4. Obedience linked to credit. It thus appears that obedience is largely compounded of creed, credence and credit. Force alone can establish power, habit alone can keep it in being, but to expand it must have credit, a thing which, even in its earlier life, it finds useful and is generally received in practice. As a description of power, rather than as a definition, we may now call it a standing corporation, which is obeyed from habit, has the means of physical compulsion, and is kept in being partly by the view taken of its strength, partly by the faith that it rules as of right, in other words, its legitimacy, and partly by the hope of its beneficence. The role played by credit in the advancement of power is strength needed underlining, so as to explain why the theories which stir the imagination concerning it are so valuable to it. Whether they induce greater respect for an abstract sovereignty, or whether they arouse more devotion to an abstract common good, they greatly aid power and open up to it new pastures. A remarkable feature of this process is that these abstract systems of thought can still be of use to power even when they do not grant it this sovereignty and do not admit its role of agent for this common good, they have done what is needed when they have implanted in the mind these two conceptions. Rousseau, for instance, though a great believer in sovereignty, was for refusing it to power and setting it up against it. Or again, socialism, having conjured up an exceedingly attractive vision of a common good, was for giving. Power no share in the task of realizing it, so far from that, it was for putting the state to death. But these negations make no difference to power, such as its position in society that it, and it only, can make itself master of this hallowed sovereignty, that there is no other agency which can materialize the fascinations of this common good. We now know what is the right angle from which to examine the theories of power. The one feature of them which is of vital importance to our inquiry is their practical assistance to power. Chapter 2. Theories of Sovereignty. 1. Divine Sovereignty. 2. Popular Sovereignty. 3. Democratic Popular Sovereignty. 4. A Dynamic of Power. 5. How Sovereignty Can Control Power. 6. The Theories of Sovereignty Considered in Their Effects.
the theories which have, in the course of time, had the most vogue in Western society and exercise there the most influence are those which explain and justify political authority by its efficient cause. These theories are those of sovereignty. Obedience, it is said, becomes a duty because of the undeniable existence of an ultimate right of command in society, called sovereignty, a right which extends to controlling the actions of society's members with, in the background, power to coerce them, a right to which all private individuals have to submit without possibility of resistance. Power makes use of this right even though in the general view it does not belong to it. It is denied that this absolute and unbounded right, transcending all private rights, can possibly belong to one man or to one group of men. Only to the most august incumbent, to God, or to society as a whole, will we commit, with no thought of bargaining reserve, the entire conduct of our lives. As we shall see, theories like those of divine right and popular sovereignty, which pass for opposites, stem in reality from the same trunk, the idea of sovereignty, the idea, that is, that somewhere there is a right to which all other rights must yield. It is not hard to discover behind this juridical concept a metaphysical one. A supreme will, it runs, rules and disposes human societies, a will which, being naturally good, it would be wrong to resist, this will is either the divine will or the general will. Power in being must be the emanation of this supreme sovereign, be it God or society, it must be the incarnation of this will and its legitimacy is proportionate to its satisfaction of these conditions. Whether as delegate or mandatory, it can then exercise the right to rule. It is at this point that the two theories, in addition to their divergent conceptions as to the nature of the sovereign, become much differentiated. As to how, for instance, and to whom, and, above all, to what extent the right to rule is given. Who will watch over its exercise, and in what manner, so that the mandatory does not fail the purpose of the sovereign. When can it be said, and by what signs can it be known, that power, by betraying its trust, has lost its legitimacy, and, having now become no more than an observable fact, can no longer claim a right transcendent? We must for the time leave these important details aside. Our present concern is with the psychological influence of these doctrines, and the way in which they have affected human beliefs in regard to power and, through them, man's attitude of mind towards it, that in its turn has determined power's extent. Have they acted on power as a discipline by forcing it to own allegiance to a beneficent being? Or have they canalized its stream by creating checks which can bind it to keep faith? Or have they limited it by restricting the share of sovereign right allowed it? Many writers on theories of sovereignty have worked out one or the other of these restrictive devices. But in the end every single such theory has, sooner or later, lost its original purpose and come to act merely as a springboard to power by providing it with the powerful aid of an invisible sovereign with whom it could in time successfully identify itself. The theory of a divine sovereignty led to absolute monarchy, the theory of a popular sovereignty led at first to parliamentary supremacy, and finally to plebiscitary absolutism. 1. Divine Sovereignty The idea that power is of God buttressed, so it is said, a monarchy that was both arbitrary and unlimited right through the Dark Ages. This grossly inaccurate conception of the Middle Ages is deeply embedded in the unlettered, whom it serves as a convenient starting point from which to unroll the history of a political evolution to the winning post, which is liberty. There is not a word of truth in all this. Let us remember, without at the moment stressing it, that power in medieval times was shared, with the Curia Regis, limited, by other authorities which were, in their own sphere, autonomous, and that, above all, it was not sovereign. The distinguishing characteristics of a power which is sovereign are, its possession of a legislative authority, its capacity to alter as it pleases its subjects' rules of behavior, while recasting at its own convenience the rules which determine its own, and, while it legislates for others, to be itself above the laws, legibus solutus, absolute. Now power in medieval times wr is very different, it was tied down, not only in theory but in practice, by the lex terrae, the customs of the country, which was thought of as a thing immutable. And when the English barons uttered their nolumus leges angliae mutari they were only giving vent to the general feeling of the time. In fact, so far from having been a cause of greatness in power, the conception of divine sovereignty was for many centuries the companion of its weakness. No doubt some fine phrases can be brought up. James I of England said to the heir to his throne, God has made of you a little God, to sit on your throne and rule men. Louis XIV's instructions to the Dauphin were in very similar terms, he who gave the world kings wished that they should be honored as his representatives, by reserving to himself alone the right to judge their actions. He who is born a subject must obey without complaining, that is God's will. Even Bossuet, when preaching at the Louvre, apostrophized his royal house as follows, You are gods even though you are mortal, and your authority is immortal. 
It is beyond question that if God, the Father and Protector of human society, has Himself designated certain men to govern it, has called them His anointed, has made them His regents, and has armed them with a sword for the administration of justice, Bosway again, then the King, strong in such a majesty, can be for His subjects nothing less than their absolute master. But phrases of this sort, and this acceptation of them, are only met with in the 17th century, in relation to the medieval theory of divine sovereignty they are the greatest heterodoxy. And here we come across a striking instance of the perversion of a theory of power to the advantage of power in being, a perversion which is, as we have already said and as will appear later, a very general phenomenon. The same idea, that power is of God, has, in the course of more than fifteen centuries, been used by its prophets for a great variety of purposes. St. Paul, it is clear, was anxious to combat in the Christian community at Rome its tendencies to civil disobedience, which would, he feared, not only precipitate persecutions but also divert the community's activities from their true purpose, which was the winning of souls. Gregory the Great, writing at a time when the West was a military anarchy, the East a prey to political instability, and the Roman way of life in imminent danger of destruction, felt under the necessity of shoring up power. The canonists of the 9th century strove to prop up the toppling imperial authority after the Church had, in the general interest, re-established it. As many periods and as many requirements, so many meanings. But it is not the case that the doctrine of divine law was dominant at any time before the Middle Ages, it was ideas derived from Roman law which formed the intellectual climate of those days. And if we take up the theory of divine sovereignty in the time of its blossoming, that is to say from the 11th to the 14th centuries, what do we find? That people are repeating St. Paul's formula, all power is of God, but less with a view to inducing subjects to obey power than to inducing power to obey, God. So far from the Church wishing to confer on princes a divine supremacy by calling them the representatives or the ministers of God, her concern was the very opposite, to make them conscious that, since they held their authority only as a trust, it was their duty to make use of it in accordance with the intention and will of the Master from whom they had received it. It was not a question of her authorizing the prince to make whatever law he pleased, but rather of bending power's will to a divine law which was its overriding master. The consecrated king of the Middle Ages was a power as tied down and as little arbitrary as we can conceive. He was simultaneously constrained by standing human law, i.e., custom, and by the divine law, and could hardly trust his own reading of his duty about anything. The court of peers was there to compel his respect for custom, and the church took care that he continued as the assiduous vicegerent of the heavenly king, whose instructions in their every point he must obey. In the act of crowning him the church warned him, through this crown, you become a sharer in our ministry, as archbishops said to French kings of the 13th century at the time of their consecration, as in the spiritual sphere we are the shepherds of souls, so in the temporal you must show yourself the true servant of God. This solemn charge she incessantly reiterated to kings. Yves de Chartres, for instance, wrote in these terms to Henry I of England after his accession, never forget it, prince, you are the servant of the servants of God and not their master, you are the protector and not the owner of your people. Lastly we may observe that, if he proved himself an unprofitable servant, she had it in her power to lay sanctions on him which were found so formidable that they brought the Emperor Henry IV to fall on his knees before Gregory VII in the snow of Canossa. Such, in the very heyday of its strength, was the theory of divine sovereignty, so little favourable was it to the exercise of a boundless authority that emperors and kings, seeking power's enlargement, could not but clash with it. Sometimes, to escape the church's yoke, we see them advance the plea that, since their authority is immediately held from God, it is not for man to supervise their use of it, this argument rests mainly on the Bible and St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, but more often, and to more purpose, they have recourse to the tradition of the Roman jurists which ascribes sovereignty not to God, but, to the people. It is for this reason that Marsilius of Padua, an adventurer who was pushing the claims of the then uncrowned emperor, Louis of Bavaria, and manned other champions of power besides, supplanted the postulate of divine sovereignty with that of popular sovereignty, the supreme legislator of the human race, he asserts, is none other than the totality of mankind, to whom the sanctions of law fall to be applied. And the reliance of power on this idea to render itself absolute is very significant. The idea would in time emancipate power from the control of the church. But there had first to be a revolution in religious ideas before power, after arguing from the people's brief against God, could take up that of God against the people, a piece of tergiversation which was a necessary step in the build-up of absolutism. The revolution needed was the crisis caused in European society by the Reformation, and the violent pleadings of Luther and his successors for a temporal power which should be freed from papal tutelage and so enabled to adopt and legalize the Reformers' doctrines.
such was the gift brought by the doctors of the Reformation to the Reformed Princes. The Hohenzollern who, in his capacity of Grand Master of the Order of Teutonic Knights, was then ruling Prussia, acting on Luther's advice, declared himself the owner of the estates which he held as administrator. The princes, breaking with the Church of Rome, took the opportunity of converting into a freehold the right of sovereignty, which had, until then, only been accorded to them as a limited mandate. Divine right, which had in the past been on the debit side of power's account, was becoming an asset. Nor did that happen in those countries only which had adopted the Reformation, but in the others as well, for the Church, being now reduced to soliciting the support of the princes, was in no position to lay on them its time-honoured ban. There lies the explanation of the divine right of kings, as we see it in the 17th century, it is a fragment taken from the context of a doctrine which had made of kings the representatives of God as regards their subjects, only to subject them at the same time to the law of God and to the control of the Church. 2. Popular Sovereignty So far from its being the case that theology gives absolutism any justification for itself, we find the Stuart and Bourbon kings, at the time that they were raising their claims, having the political treatises of Jesuit doctors burnt by the common hangman. These doctors not only prayed and aid the supremacy of the pontiff, the Pope can depose kings and put others in their place, as he has done already, but also constructed a theory of authority which shelved completely the idea of a direct mandate entrusted to kings by the heavenly sovereign. In their view, while it is true that power is of God, it was not true that God had selected the beneficiary. Power is an emanation of his will because he has given man a social nature, and has, therefore, caused him to live in a community, of this community civil government is a necessary feature. But he has not himself organized this government. That is the business of the people of this community, who must, for reasons of practical necessity, bestow it on some person or persons. These holders of power manage something which is of God, and are therefore subjected to his law. But, in addition, it is the community which has entrusted them with this something, and on conditions laid down by itself. That makes them accountable to the community. It is for the will of the people, says Bayarman, to set up a king, consuls or other magistrates. And if good cause comes, the people may exchange monarchy for aristocracy or democracy, and vice versa, history tells us that it happened so at Rome. It is easy to imagine with what fury a man of James I's arrogance reads statements like these, it was then that he wrote his apology. For the Oath of Allegiance. Suarez's refutation of it, written to the order of Pope Paul V, was publicly burnt in front of St. Paul's in London. James I had claimed that, confronted by an unjust royal command, the people may do no other than flee unresistingly from the anger of its king, its tears and sighs are the only answer to him allowed it, and it may summon none but God to its aid. To this Bayarman replied, no people ever delegated its authority without reservation, by which it may in appropriate cases resume it in act. According to this Jesuit doctrine, it is the community which, by the act of forming itself, establishes power. The city-state or republic is formed of a species of political union, which could not have taken shape without a sort of convention, expressed or implied, by which families and individuals subject themselves to a superior authority or social administrator, the aforesaid convention being the condition on which the community exists. In this formula of his, Suarez has anticipated the theory of the social contract. Society is formed and power established by the will and consent of the multitude. To the extent that the people invest its rulers with the right to rule them, there is a pactum subjectionis. The object of this reconstruction was, it is clear, to bar power's road to absolutism. But it was soon distorted, as we shall see, in such a way that it served to justify absolutism. How was it possible to do that? Merely by taking away from the three following expressions the first one, God the author of power, the people who confer power, the rulers who receive it and exercise it. It is affirmed, after this abstraction, that power belongs to society in full fee simple and is then conferred by it alone on its rulers. That is the theory of popular sovereignty. It may be objected that, more surely than any other, this theory bars the road to absolutism. That, as we shall see, is the great illusion. The medieval champions of power conducted their case clumsily enough. Marsilius of Padua, for instance, after postulating that the supreme legislator was the totality of mankind, goes on to the proposition that this authority has been conferred on the Roman people, and he reaches this triumphant conclusion, finally, if the Roman people has conferred legislative power on its prince, then there is no escaping the conclusion that this power belongs to the prince of the Romans, to, in other words, Marsilius's client, Louis of Bavaria. The argument makes no attempt to conceal its lack of disinterestedness. The point of it is, as any child could see, that the multitude has been endowed with this majestic authority merely that it may pass it on, stage by stage, 
to a despot. In course of time, however, the selfsame dialectic will find more plausible guise in which to present itself. Here, for instance, is Hobbes, who, right in the middle of the 17th century, which was the heyday of the divine right of kings, wanted to undertake the defense of absolute monarchy. Notice how he avoids using the biblical arguments which will be the stock and trade of Bishop Filmer a generation later, only to go down before the arrows of Locke. Hobbes does not infer the unlimited right of power from the sovereignty of God, he infers it from the sovereignty of the people. He assumes that men were, in the natural state, free, but he defines this primitive freedom, in terms more appropriate to a doctor than to a jurist, as the absence of every external compulsion. This freedom of action continues to the point at which it comes up against someone else's freedom, when the conflict is resolved according to the forces at the disposal of each. Each individual, as Spinoza put it, has a sovereign right over whatever is in his power, in other words, the right of each extends to the precise limit of the power which each has. There is, therefore, no other effective right than that of tigers to eat men. Some way out of this state of nature, where each takes what he can and holds as best he can what he has taken, had to be found. For this wild sort of liberty made both security and civilization equally impossible. Had not men, therefore, to come to the point of making a mutual surrender of their rights for the sake of peace and order? Hobbes goes to the length of giving the formula on which the social pact was concluded. I surrender my right to rule myself to this man or to this assembly on condition that you make a like surrender of yours. In this way the multitude has become a single person which goes by the name of a city or a republic. Such is the origin of this leviathan or terrestrial deity, to whom we owe all peace and all safety. The man or assembly on whom the hitherto unlimited individual rights have now been unreservedly conferred is the possessor of an unlimited collective right. Thenceforward, the English philosopher asserts. Each subject having been made, by the establishment of the Republic, the author of all the actions and judgments of the sovereign established, the sovereign, whatever he does, does no wrong to any of his subjects, and can never be accused of injustice by any of them. For, acting as he does only on a mandate, what right could those who have given him this mandate have to complain of him? By this establishment of the Republic, each individual is the author of whatever the sovereign does, consequently, Anyone who claims that the sovereign is wronging him is objecting to acts of which he is himself the author, and has only himself to accuse. Surely this is all very extravagant. But Spinoza, though in less striking language, affirms no less the unlimited right of power. Whether the supreme power belongs to one man, or is shared among several, or is common to all, it is certain that to whoever has it belongs also the sovereign right of giving any order he pleases. The subject is bound to an absolute obedience as long as the king, or the nobles, or the people, retain the sovereign power which the conveyance of rights has conferred on them. He too asserts, the sovereign, to whom all is of right allowed, cannot violate the rights of the subjects. Here then we have two illustrious philosophers inferring the most complete despotism from the principle of popular sovereignty. Whoever has the sovereign power can do whatever he likes, and the subject who is wrong must regard himself as the actual author of the unjust act. We are bound to execute to the limit whatever orders the sovereign gives us, even though they should be the silliest imaginable, pontificates Spinoza. How different is the language held by St. Augustine, but, inasmuch as we believe in God and have been summoned to his kingdom, we have been subjected to no man who should seek to destroy the gift of eternal life which God has given us. What a contrast is here between a power which is held to the execution of the divine law and one which, after subsuming every individual right, has become a law to itself. 3. Democratic Popular Sovereignty Given that there was at first a state of nature in which men were bound by no laws, and rights, so called, were no more than the measure of each man's strength, and on the hypothesis that they formed a society by commissioning a sovereign to establish order among them, then it follows that this sovereign received from them all their own rights, and that in consequence the individual has none in reserve wherewith to oppose him. Spinoza has put the point very clearly. Everyone has had, whether by an express or an implied agreement, to confer on the sovereign their entire stock of means of self-preservation, in other words, all their natural right. Had they wished to keep back for themselves any part of this right, they must at the same time have taken defensive measures for their own safety, as they have not done that and must, had they done it, have divided and in the end destroyed all rule, they have in fact subjected themselves to the will, however it operates, of the sovereign power. To this it was no answer to suppose, as Locke did, that all individual rights were not put in the common stock and that some were kept back by the contracting parties. This hypothesis, though destined to bear fruit politically, holds no water logically. Rousseau will be found at a later date pouring scorn on Locke's reasoning, 
the alienation of individual rights is made unreservedly. And none of the partners can henceforward claim back anything, for, if there were still any rights in private hands, then, as there would be no superior in common to pronounce between them and the public right, the result would be that each man, finding himself his own judge in something, would soon claim to be it in everything. Will it perhaps seem to someone, asks a troubled Spinoza, that by this principle we are making men slaves? His answer is that what makes a man a slave is not obedience but obedience in the interest of a master. If the orders given are in the interests of the man who obeys, then he is not a slave but a subject. But this raises the problem of how to ensure that the sovereign never considers the interest of the ruler but only the interest of the ruled. The solution of confronting him with an overseer, a defender of the people, is ruled out in advance, because, he is himself the people, and the individual has no rights left to him wherewith to arm against the whole any check or counterweight. Hobbes admits that the state of subjects who are exposed to all the irregular passions of the man or men who own such an unlimited authority, may be one of great misery. The people's only hope is in the personal excellence of the man or men whom they obey. Who is it to be? In Hobbes' view, men had bound themselves by their original contract to obey either a monarch or an assembly, his own marked preference was for a monarch. In Spinoza's view, they had bound themselves to obey either a king, or a nobility, or a people, and he stressed the advantages of the last of these solutions. In Rousseau's view, no choice was conceivable, men could bind themselves to obey nothing but their totality. Whereas Hobbes made his man concluding the social pact say, I surrender my right to rule myself to this man or to these men, Rousseau, when drafting a constitution for the Corsicans, made each contracting party say, with my body, my goods, my will and my entire strength I join myself to the Corsican nation, to whom I now belong in fee simple, I and my dependence. Once there is postulated a right of command which has no limits and against which the private person has no rights, and that is the logical result of the hypothesis of the social pact, then it is much less terrible to conceive of this right as belonging collectively to all than as belonging to one man only or to a few. Rousseau, like his predecessors, held that what constitutes sovereignty is the surrender without reservation of individual rights, these then go to form a collective right, the sovereigns, which is absolute. On this point all the theories of popular sovereignty are in agreement. In Hobbes' view, however, a surrender of rights presupposed someone, whether a man or an assembly, to whom to surrender them, the will of this someone, in whom is vested the collective right, would thereafter pass for, and stand legally as, the will of all. Spinoza, and others too, conceded that the collective right might be vested in the will either of one man, or of several men, or of a majority. Hence the three traditional forms of government, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. According to this line of thought the originating act by which a society and a sovereignty were created set up ipso facto the government which is the sovereign. And to many thinkers of note it seemed unthinkable that, once the fundamental hypothesis was accepted, any other course of events was possible. In Rousseau's view, however, the process has two stages, first, individuals turn themselves into a people, next, they give themselves a government. The result is that, whereas in previous systems the people gave the collective right, the sovereignty, in the act of creating it, in as they create it without giving it, in fact they never part with it. Rousseau allowed in principle all the three forms of government and considered democracy appropriate to small states, aristocracy appropriate to those of moderate size, and monarchy appropriate to large ones. 4. A dynamic of power. In any case, the government is not the sovereign. Rousseau calls the government the prince or the magistrate, names which may signify a collection of men, thus a senate may be the prince, and in a perfect democracy the people itself is the magistrate. It is true that this prince or magistrate is the ruler. What is title to rule is not sovereign, does not derive from that limitless imperium which is the essence of sovereignty, all he does is to exercise such powers as have been conferred on him. Only, when once the idea of an absolute sovereignty has even been conceived and its existence asserted to rest in the body of society, great is the temptation, and great also are the opportunities, for the ruling body to seize it. Although Rousseau was, in our opinion, quite wrong in supposing that so overpowering a right existed at all, his theory has the merit of accounting for the growth of power, and brings into play a political dynamic. Rousseau saw very clearly that the agents of power form a core, that this core houses a core mind, and that its aim is to usurp sovereignty. The more they redouble their efforts, the more the constitution changes, and, in the absence of any other core mind to resist the prince's, powers, and thus bring it into equilibrium, the time must come sooner or later when the prince, power, ends by oppressing the sovereign, the people, and thereby breaks the social contract. This is the inherent and inevitable weakness which, from the day that the body politic is born, 
tends ceaselessly to destroy it, even as old age and death destroy at last the physical body. This theory of power marks a great advance on those so far examined by us. The others explain power by the possession of an unlimited right of command, whether that right emanated from God or from the social totality. But none of them gave any clue to the reason why, as one power succeeded another or one period in the life of the same power succeeded another, the area over which command and obedience operated should show such variations. In Rousseau's powerful reconstruction, on the other hand, we do find an attempt at explanation. If power's extent varies from one society to another, the reason is that the body social, in which alone sovereignty resides, has made larger or smaller grants of its exercise. Above all, if the same power's extent varies in the course of that power's life, the reason is that it tends unceasingly to usurp sovereignty and can, in the measure of its success, dispose of the people and their resources more completely and more uninhibitedly. The result is that, the greater the element of usurpation in a government, so much the wider is the range of its authority. What, however, is not explained is the source from which power draws the strength necessary to effect this usurpation. For, if it owes its strength to the mass of the people and to the fact that it is the incarnation of the general will, then it must, with its every deviation from that general will, lose strength, and its authority must tend to disappear to the extent to which it separates itself from the popular desire. Rousseau's view was that government, by a natural slant, tends to move from many men to few or from democracy to aristocracy, he instances the case of Venice, and in the end to monarchy, regarded by him as the final form of society, and monarchy, by becoming despotic, causes in the end the death of the body social. But there is nothing in history to show that such a serial movement is inevitable. Nor is any light thrown on the question from what source one man gets strength enough to have executed a will which is cut off ever more completely from the general will. The weakness of the theory lies in its heterogeneity. It has the merit of treating power as a separate entity, a body which house strength, but it still thinks of sovereignty, in the medieval manner, as a right. In this mix-up power's strength remains quite unexplained, and there is no clue to the social forces which are able to moderate or check it. All the same, what an advance this is on the earlier theories. And, on the essential points, what foresight? 5. How sovereignty can control power. The theory of popular sovereignty, as Rousseau left it, offers a rather striking parallel to the medieval theory of divine sovereignty. Both allow a right of command which, though it is unlimited, is not inherent in the governors. The right belongs to a superior power, whether it be God or the people, which cannot by its nature exercise the right itself. Therefore they have to confer a mandate on a power which can exercise it. Both state more or less explicitly that the mandatories will be tied by rules, in other words, power's behavior is subject to either the divine will or the general will. But will these mandatories necessarily be faithful to their trust? Or will they tend to usurp the command which they at present exercise only by delegation? Will they remember at all points the end for which they have been established, which is the common good, and the condition to which they have been subjected, which is the execution of the law, whether God's or the people's? Will they, in short, keep their hands off the sovereignty? They will not, and they will in the end give themselves out as resuming in their own persons the divine will or the general will, as the case may be, Louis XIV, for instance, claim the rights of God, and Napoleon those of the people. Is there any way of stopping this, except by the exercise of control by the sovereign over the power? The sovereign's nature, unfortunately, makes it as impossible for him to control as to govern. Hence came the idea of having a body which would keep watch in the name of the sovereign over the actual power, prescribe as occasion demanded the rules by which it must act, and, in case of need, pronounce the forfeiture of its functions and make provision for a successor. Under the system of divine sovereignty this body could only be the church. Under the system of popular sovereignty it will be parliament. As a result of this however, sovereignty becomes a house divided, and the powers in human exercise show two faces. These are either a temporal power and a spiritual power exercising a temporal jurisdiction, or, in the other case, an executive and a legislature. The whole metaphysic of sovereignty leads to this division, and yet abominates it. Empiricists may find in it a safeguard for liberty but it must surely be an offense to all who believe in a sovereignty which is in essence one and indivisible. As though sovereignty could be shared between two sets of agents. If two wills clash, both cannot be the divine or popular, as the case may be. It follows that of the two bodies one only can be the true reflex of the sovereign, the will opposing is, in that case, a rebel will to be subdued. These results follow logically if the basis of power is one will which must be obeyed. One of the bodies, therefore, had to win. At the close of the Middle Ages the winner was the monarchy. In modern times it is either the executive or the legislature, 
according to which stands closer to the sovereign people. The chief executive does so when, as in the case of Louis Napoleon or Roosevelt, there is direct election of him by the people, the parliament does so when, as in the France of the Third Republic, the chief executive is at a distance from the source of authority. So far as the controllers of power are concerned, one of two things results, either they are finally eliminated, or else, acting in the name of the sovereign, they subdue his agents and usurp the sovereignty. In this connection it is worth noting that Rousseau, while cutting down as far as was possible the authority of the rulers, had a deep distrust for representatives, who were, in his time, greatly relied on for keeping power within the bounds of its office. He saw no other method of preventing usurpations of government than that of holding periodic popular assemblies, to pronounce on the use which had been made of power and to decide whether it would not be a good thing to change the form and the personnel of the government. As he fully admitted that his method was quite impracticable, the obstinacy with which he urged it can only be ascribed to the invincible repugnance which the method of control at that time operating in England inspired in him, the method of parliamentary control, which Montesquieu had praised to the skies. So distasteful to him is the very idea that he inveighs against it with a sort of passion. Sovereignty cannot be represented. Therefore the deputies of the people are not and cannot be its representatives. This newfangled idea of representatives comes down to us from feudal government, from that iniquitous and ridiculous form of government which made degenerates of the human species and caused the name of man to stink in the nostrils. His attack is against the representative system as it was operating in the very country of which Montesquieu had made a model of excellence. The English think they are free but they are quite wrong, they are only free when parliamentary elections come round, once the members have been elected, they are slaves and things of naught. They deserve to lose liberty by reason of the use which they make of their brief intervals of liberty. Why all this spleen? With a sovereignty on this great scale, Rousseau felt that, once the possibility of the sovereign being represented was admitted, it would be impossible to stop the representative laying claim to the sovereignty. And indeed every tyranny which has since appeared has justified its aggressions on individual rights by its usurped claim to represent the people. More especially, he foresaw what seems to have escaped Montesquieu, that the authority of Parliament, though for the time being it would grow at the expense of the executive and so act as a break on power, would come in the end first to dominate the executive and then to fuse it with itself, thus reconstituting a power which could lay claim to sovereignty. 6. The theories of sovereignty considered in their effects. If we now take a bird's eye view of the theories whose natures we have just examined, we note that all of them tend to render subjects obedient by revealing to them a transcendent principle behind the power they see. This principle, whether God or the people, is armed with an absolute authority. At the same time they all tend also to subordinate power in effect to this principle, whichever it is. Therefore their disciplinary effect is twofold, they discipline the subject, they also discipline power. By disciplining the subject they reinforce the power in being. But by straightly tying this power down, they compensate for this reinforcement, always provided that they can find some practical method of keeping the power down. That is the difficulty. The more unlimited the conception of the sovereign authority which there is danger of powers usurping, and the greater the consequent danger to society if power usurps it, the more important become the practical methods employed to keep power in leading strings. But the sovereign cannot make the whole of his presence felt to keep his regents to their duty. Therefore he needs a controlling body, this body, whether its place is above the government or at its side, will in time try to seize it thus joining in one the two capacities of regent and overseer and thereby securing for itself unlimited authority of command. This danger leads to a multiplication of precautions, the power and its controller are, by a division of functions or a rapid succession of office holders, crumbled up into small pieces, a cause of weakness and disorder in the administration of society's business. Then, inevitably, the disorder and weakness, becoming at length intolerable, bring together again the crumbled pieces of sovereignty, and there is power, armed now with a despotic authority. The wider the conception held, in the time when monopoly of it seemed a vain imagining, of the right of sovereignty, the harsher will be the despotism. If the view is that a community's laws admit of no modification whatever, the laws will contain the despot. Or if the view is that something of these laws, corresponding to the ordinances of God, is immutable, that part at least will remain fast. And now we begin to see that popular sovereignty may give birth to a more formidable despotism than divine sovereignty. For a tyrant, whether he be one or many, who has, by hypothesis, successfully usurped one or the other sovereignty, cannot avail himself of the divine will, which shows itself to men under the forms of a law eternal, to command whatever he pleases. Whereas the popular will has no natural stability but is changeable, so far from being tied to a law, its voice may be heard in laws which change and succeed each other. 
so that a usurping power has, in such a case, more elbow room, it enjoys more liberty, and its liberty is the name of arbitrary power. Chapter 3. The Organic Theories of Power. 1. The Nominalist Conception of Society. 2. The Realist Conception of Society. 3. Logical Consequences of the Realist Conception. 4. The Division of Labor and Organicism. 5. Society, a Living Organism. 6. The Problem of Power's Extent in the Organicist Theory. 7. Water for Towers Mill. The explanation of and justification for civil obedience is, according to the theories of sovereignty, the right of command which power derives from its origin, whether divine or popular. But has not power an end as well? Must it not tend to the common good, vague and variable of content as the phrase is, its uncertain meaning corresponding to the indefinite nature of human aspiration? And can it happen that a power, though legitimate enough in origin, governs in a way which is so flatly opposed to the common good that obedience to it may be called in question? Theologians have often debated this problem and have evolved from their debates the idea of the end. Some have argued that even an unjust power must be obeyed, but most of them, and all the highest authorities among them, have held the contrary view that a government with an unjust end could not be legitimated by its origin. And particularly St. Thomas seems to attach more importance to the end of power than to its origin, revolt against an authority which is not aiming at the common good ceases to be seditious. The idea of the end, after having played in medieval Catholic thought the part of a corrective to the idea of sovereignty, the obedience due to a power by reason of its legitimacy could, that is to say, be disclaimed if the power stopped aiming at the common good, suffered eclipse in the theories of popular sovereignty. Not, to be sure, that people stopped saying that the function of power was to achieve the general advantage, no one ever went as far as that. But the hypothesis was made that a power which was the legitimate emanation of society would for that very reason never cease to seek the social good, because the general will is always righteous and always aims at the public advantage. In the 19th century, but not before, the idea of the end reappears, but its influence then is quite different from that which it exercised in the Middle Ages. In those days it had, in effect, served as an obstacle to the development of power. But in the 19th century it will be seen furthering its development. This reversal is related to an entirely new way of picturing society, which is now regarded not as an aggregate of individuals with common legal principles, but as a developing organism. We must pause to examine this intellectual revolution, because it is from it that the new theories of the final cause derive their importance and their character. 1. The Nominalist Conception of Society The explanation of, and to a large extent the corrective for, the theories of sovereignty are to be found in the conception of society which was in vogue at the time of their foundation. Before the 19th century it never occurred to any Western thinker to suppose that there was, in any collection of men subject to a common political direction, anything with a real existence except individuals. That had been the point of view of the Romans. They looked on the Roman people as an assemblage of human beings, not, it is true, just any assemblage, but one which was held together by ties of law to the end of a common advantage. They never imagined that this assemblage could be the parent of a person who was distinct from the persons making it up. Where we now say France, with the sensation of talking about a real person, they used to say, according to the date of the speaker, either the people and commons of Rome, or the senate and people of Rome, signifying, by this essentially descriptive appellation, that what they saw in their minds I was not a person, Rome, but rather the physical reality of a collection of individuals belonging to a group. What the word people, in its wider acceptation, evoked for them was something entirely concrete, namely the Roman citizens gathered in conclave. They had no need of a word equivalent to our nation because the adding up of individuals resulted, as they saw it, only in an arithmetical total, and not in a quite different sort of creature. They had just as little need of the word state, because they were not conscious of a thing transcendent, living above and beyond themselves, but only of certain interests which they had in common and which made up the res publica. In this conception, which Rome bequeathed to the Middle Ages, the only reality is man. The medieval theologians and the philosophers of the 17th and 18th centuries were at one in proclaiming that men preceded any and every society. They established society only when, either because of the corruption of their nature, the theologians, or by reason of the savagery of their instincts, Hobbes, they found it necessary to do so. But this society of theirs is still an artificial body, Rousseau says so expressly, and even Hobbes, though he had put as a frontispiece to one of his works a picture of a giant outlined in a composite of human shapes, seems never to have supposed that Leviathan lived a life of his own. He has no will, but the will of a man or of an assembly passes for his will. This purely nominalist conception of society renders intelligible the notion of sovereignty.
society consists only of associated men, whose disassociation is always possible. An authoritarian, like Hobbes, and a libertarian, like Rousseau, are at one in this. The former sees in disassociation a disaster which must be prevented with the utmost rigor, the latter a last resource for oppressed citizens. But, given that society is but an artificial assemblage of naturally independent men, think of the effort needed to bring their separate behaviors into line and force them to admit a common authority. The mystery of the foundation of society requires a divine intervention for its explanation or, at the very least, a first solemn convention of the entire people. Think too of the prestige needed to maintain day by day the cohesion of the whole. There must have been some title to compel respect and one which could not for its purpose be too exalted, in short, sovereignty, whether or not it is agreed to confer it at once on power. Certain it is that, when independent persons agree to regulate their intercourse and appoint commissioners to the task of regulation, the perpetuity of the tie and the strict execution of the obligations entered into can be assured only by the ascription of the utmost majesty possible to those whose continuous duty it will be to bring back straying wills to the common path. In our own time we have seen a social contract concluded between persons in the state of nature, vellum omnium contra omnes. Those persons were the powerful nations of the world, and that contract was the League of Nations. And this artificial body became disassociated for the absence in it of any power which a right transcendent had so buttressed that the rights of the component nations could not oppose it. In just the same way a rugby team, if I may take a more familiar illustration, must have an arbitral authority for thirty embattled giants to obey the solitary referee's whistle. Given the abstract problem of making and maintaining an association between independent elements, given the conception that the nature of these elements underwent no substantial change by their adherence to the social pack, given the belief that nonconformity and secession were always possible courses, it will be seen that a majestic sort of sovereignty, which could cloak its weak and naked magistrates with its own dignity, was indispensable. Seen in the picture of its own postulates, the idea is not only logical but has a certain grandeur. Given, however, that society is a natural and necessary fact, that it is materially and morally impossible for a man to withdraw from it, and that factors quite other than the measure of force in laws and state compel his social conformity, then the support for power which the theory of sovereignty gives becomes excessive and dangerous. The dangers adduced by it remain partly concealed so long as minds retain the imprint of the basic hypothesis which brought sovereignty to birth, namely that man are the reality and society a convention. This opinion does carry with it the idea that human personality is an absolute value to which society stands only in the relation of a means. This is the source of declarations of the rights of man, rights against which the right of sovereignty itself breaks in vain. This defeat of sovereignty must seem logically absurd if it is remembered that its right is, by definition, absolute, but it will seem the most natural thing in the world if it is remembered that the body politic is an artificial thing, sovereignty just a prestige with which it is armed with a view to a certain end, and that all these shadows are as dust against the reality of the human being. We may say then that, so long as social philosophy continued individualist and nominalist, the notion of sovereignty could do little harm, its ravages began as soon as this philosophy started to decay. From this point, we may note in passing, the double acceptation of the word democracy begins, in the sense of individualist social philosophy it is the rule of the rights of man, in a political philosophy divorced from social individualism it is the absolutism of a government which draws its title from the masses. 2. The realist conception of society. Thought is less independent than is supposed, and philosophers more indebted than they admit to fashionable idols and popular parlance. Before metaphysics could affirm the reality of society, the latter had first to take the shape of a being which bore the name of nation. This was an outcome, perhaps its most important, of the French Revolution. When the Legislative Assembly had plunged France into a military escapade which the monarchy would never have risked, it soon appeared that her power's resources were insufficient for opposing the rest of Europe, and it became necessary to require the almost total participation of her people in the war. This was an unprecedented demand. In whose name to make it? In that of a discredited king? Emphatically no. It must be in the name of the nation, the patriotism which had for a thousand years taken the form of attachment to a person naturally inclined men's minds to attach to the nation the character and aspect of a person whose lineaments were promptly fixed by a thousand pencils. Not to recognize the psychological disturbance and metamorphosis set in train by the revolution is to linger in misconception of the whole of subsequent European history, including the history of thought. In former times, as after Malplaquet, Frenchmen ranged themselves about the king, it was a case of individuals bringing succor to a loved and respected chief. But now it is the nation in which, as members of a whole, they range themselves. This conception of a whole, leading a life of its own which is superior to that of its parts, 
was in all probability always below the surface. But the process of its crystallization was to be sudden. It was not that the throne was overthrown, but that the whole of the nation person, mounted it. Its life was as that of the king it succeeded, but it had one great advantage over him, for subjects are, in regard to a king, who is seen to be a person different from themselves, naturally careful to secure their rights. Whereas the nation is not a person different, it is the subject himself, and yet it is more than he, it is a hypostatized we. Nor does it make any difference to this revolution in ideas that in sober fact power remains much more like its old self than is generally thought, and, in any case, quite distinct from the actual people it rules. For what matters are beliefs. And the belief which then gained credit in France and later spread over Europe was that the nation person has an existence and is the natural repository of power. The French army sowed the seed of this faith all over Europe, as much and more by the disillusionments which they occasioned as by the effect of the gospel which they brought in their train. Those who, like Fichte, had been at first the most enthusiastic in their welcome, turned in the end the most impassioned preachers of opponent nationalisms. At the time that German national feeling had taken wing Hegel formulated the first coherent doctrine of the new phenomenon and awarded the nation a certificate of philosophical being. His doctrine, if contrasted with Rousseau's, emphasizes the extent of the change which has come over the concept of society. What Rousseau calls civil society corresponds to society is thought of up to the revolution. In it the individual members are what matter, and the greatest care is due to their particular ends and interests. But, to safeguard these individuals against both danger from without and the potential injury which they may do each other, institutions are necessary. Order and power to guarantee it are demanded by the interest of the individual himself. Yet with whatever efficaciousness it is thought needful to endow this order and with whatever range this power, theirs is a morally subordinate position, for they have been established only with a view to enabling individuals to pursue their individual ends. Hegel's idea of state, on the other hand, corresponds to the new conception of society. Just as a man does not regard the family as a mere convenience, but joins to it his own ego and accepts life on terms of being a member of this unit, so do there come to him the conception of being a member of the nation, the recognition that he is bound to share in a collective life, the conscious integration of his activity with the general activity, the sensation of pleasure in the society's accomplishments, in short, he makes the society an end. 3. Logical Consequences of the Realist Conception Such, in as simple language as possible, is Hegel's conception. The closeness of its correspondence to an evolution of political feelings is clear to see. In the 19th and 20th centuries people will be found thinking of society as Hegel did without ever having heard of him, for the reason that, in this field, his work was merely to endow with form a belief which had always lurked more or less consciously in many minds. This novel conception of society had momentous consequences. The idea of the common good now gets a completely different content from its former one. It is no longer a question simply of helping each individual to realize his own private good, which is clear-cut enough, but of achieving a social good of a much less definite character. The idea of an end in power takes on an importance quite different from that given it in the Middle Ages. The end was then justice, jus suum quicque tribuere, to ensure that each obtained his due. But what was the due? That which an immovable law custom acknowledged to be his. Hence it resulted that the idea of an end or final cause could not be used to extend the area of power. But all is changed when the rights that belong to individuals, their subjective rights, give place to an ever more exalted morality which must needs be realized in society. By reason of this end, there is no extension of itself which power, as the agent of this realization, cannot justify. From that time on, then, as we can easily see, place is made for theories of the final cause of power which power finds exceedingly advantageous to itself. It has only, for example, to make the vague concept of social justice its end. And power itself, how does this new idea affect it? There is now a collective being, which is of far greater importance than individuals, clearly, then, the right transcendent of sovereignty belongs to none other. It is the sovereignty of the nation which is, as has often been stressed, a very different thing from the sovereignty of the people. In the latter, Rousseau said it, the sovereign is only the individuals who go to the making of him. But in the former, Society fulfills itself as a whole only to the extent that partakers of it know themselves for members and see in it their end, from which it follows logically that those only who have attained to this knowledge are steering society towards its fulfillment. In them is all guidance and leadership, the general will coincides with their will only, theirs is the general will. It is Hegel's claim to have clarified in this way an idea which, as found in Rousseau, is, it must be admitted, somewhat confused. For the Genevan philosopher, after telling us that the general will is righteous and tends always to the public advantage, 
remembered too well the many unjust or disastrous decisions taken by the Athenian people not to add, it does not follow that the people's deliberations are always on the same level of rectitude, and even further, there is often a big difference between the will of all and the general will, it is the latter which looks only to the public interest. All this is meaningless unless the prescriptions, is righteous and tends always to the public advantage and looks only to the public interest, are taken as the attributes of an ideal will. That is Hegel's point, general will is that which tends to the end in view, conceived no longer as that which private interests have in common but as the realization of the higher collective life. The motive force of society is the general will, which does all that needs to be done, whether or not the individuals who lack consciousness of the end are ascending parties. It is now, in short, a question of inducing in the body social a new efflorescence, the vision of which is possessed by its conscious members only. These latter form the universal class in distinction to all the rest, who remain the prisoners of their own particularisms. It is, then, the business of the conscious part to do for the whole the necessary willing. That, for Hegel, does not mean that the part is free to choose for the whole whatever future it pleases. So far from that, it would be truer to say that its recognition of what the whole should be both now and in the future is what makes it the conscious part. In using hothouse methods to force the whole to be what it should be it acts merely as an accoucher and, even if it uses force, does the whole know violence. It is easy to see how valuable this theory may prove to a group of men who, claiming to be the conscious part, claim also to know the end in view, in the assured conviction that it is their will alone which marches with the rational will for its sake and for its fruits of which Hegel speaks. The Prussian administration, for instance, then in the full tide of development, found in Hegelianism the justification both for what it was doing and for its authoritarian methods of doing it. The Beamtenstadt, bureaucracy, the power of expert officialdom, is sure that its will represents no arbitrary caprice but a knowledge of what should be. In the result it both can and must shove the people into such ways of acting and thinking as will best realize the end which reason has permitted these experts to envisage. The vision of what should be, thus envisaged in a group, casts this group for a leading part. In Marx's scientific socialism there is no doubt as to what the proletariat should be. Therefore the proletariat, being the conscious part, may speak and will in the name of the whole, its duty is to give the inert mass consciousness of the building of a proletarian whole. At a later stage the proletariat, when it has come to know itself, disappears as a class and becomes the social whole. Again, and in the same way, the fascist party, being the conscious part of the nation, does the nation's willing and wills it to be what it should be. All these doctrines, which sanction in practice the right of a minority, calling it self-conscious, to direct a majority, spring directly from Hegelianism. It is, moreover, far from being the case that the systems with an obviously Hegelian pedigree are the only children of the conception of a social whole. This conception, as was said earlier, was widespread in the thought of the post-revolutionary period, it is not, therefore, surprising to find modern politics impregnated with it. Whereas in earlier centuries the actual people could be represented only in its multiple aspects, by the states general, or not at all, according to Rousseau, the whole can now find expression in those who know, or claim to know, what must be its becoming, and who are for that reason, or claim to be, in a position to express the objective will. It will be either an oligarchy of elected persons or popular groupings speaking in the name of the nation with an absolute assurance. It will be, whatever its group or party, the sole repository of truth. And opposition parties, with a different conception of the end, will also aspire to direct the whole without hindrance. To sum up, the sensation of a common national emotion has caused society to be looked on as a whole. Not as yet a realized whole, because many of the individuals in a society do not yet behave as the members of a whole, from not knowing that they are members rather than individuals. This whole, however, fulfills itself as such to the extent that its conscious members lead the rest on to behave and think in the way that is required to enable the whole to fulfill itself as such. And for that reason the conscious members both can and must push and pull the unconscious. Hegel does not seem to have wanted to construct an authoritarian theory. But his theory is known by its fruits. 4. The Division of Labor and Organicism Meanwhile, the middle of the 19th century found attention as much riveted on industrial progress and the social changes resulting therefrom as, in the beginning of the century, it was riveted on the phenomenon of nationalism. This stupendous change, which had proceeded at a breakneck speed almost since the time of the social contract, had, almost in the act of taking wing, received its interpretation from Adam Smith. The author of The Wealth of Nations, a work whose fame has not been dimmed by time, explained the influence of the division of labor on a society's productivity. 
Soon the idea was widespread that the further the lengths to which the individuals in a community push the specialization of their particular activities, the greater will be the production of that community, or, as Bentham put it, the more means of happiness will they create. The idea has won all hearts by reason of the twofold movement which it brings to light, though, to be sure, the two paths join in the end. Hegel turned it to good account, recalling that Plato in his Republic had rigorously stressed the importance of the citizens remaining undifferentiated and had seen in that the essential condition of social unity, Hegel asserted that the characteristic of the modern state was, contrarywise, to allow a process of differentiation, by which an ever-growing diversity could be ranged within an ever-richer unity. This anticipated what Durkheim says in our time, he sets off the mechanical solidarity of a primitive society, in which the individuals are held together by their similarity, against the organic solidarity of a mature society, the members of which have, just by reason of their being differentiated, become necessary to each other. Auguste Comte, who distinguished very clearly the material and the moral effects of the phenomenon, gave this concept of the division of labor its first introduction to political thought. In the material order, as he admitted, human activities, by becoming differentiated, tend to their more effective interplay between themselves and he is not convinced that the process of adjusting all these differences is as automatic as it was made out to be by the liberal economists, whose laissez-faire he condemns, and conceives it to be the duty of the public authority to take a hand in facilitating this adjustment. But, and this above all, the process, as he notices, induces a moral differentiation which calls for remedy. It is the business of power. To restrain an adequate measure and to forestall as far as possible this fatal tendency towards that fundamental cleavage of sentiments and interests which results inevitably from the very principle of human development, and which, if it were allowed to follow its natural course unchecked, would end inevitably by blocking social advance. But the astounding career of the concept of the division of labor did not end here. It is now to overrun biology, and thereafter to return, by way of Spencer, to the field of political thought, its content enriched and its impetus heightened. Biology made a decisive advance when it came to see every living organism as a structure of cells. These cells show, it is true, an almost infinite diversity as between one organism and another and even within the same organism, and the higher the form of life, the greater is the variety of cells which make it up. The loan from political economy of the concept of division of labor then brought forth the idea that all these cells had, by a process of functional differentiation, evolved from a primitive cell which was relatively simple and the successive stages in the perfection of organisms corresponded to stages in the progress of the natural division of labor. So that in the end organisms came to be regarded as higher and higher forms of one and the same process, that of cellular cooperation by way of division of labor, or else as societies of cells of an ever-growing complexity. Here we have one of the most fruitful ideas which the history of thought has to show us. And, though modern science no longer accepts it in its original form, its appearance, as we know, shook existing ideas, over which it established an absolute predominance, and brought new ones to birth, notably in the field of political science. If biology saw organisms as societies, how in its turn could political thought have failed to see societies as organisms? Almost simultaneously with the publication of The Origin of Species, November 1859, Herbert Spencer published in the Westminster Review, January 1860, a reverberating article entitled The Social Organism. There he sets out the resemblances between human societies and cellular organisms. Both of them, commencing as small aggregations, insensibly augment in mass, some of them eventually reaching 10,000 times what they originally were. While at first so simple in structure as to be considered structureless, both assume, in the course of their growth, a continually increasing complexity of structure. Though in their early, undeveloped states there exists in them scarcely any mutual dependence of parts, their parts gradually acquire a mutual dependence which becomes at last so great that the activity and life of each part is made possible only by the activity and life of the rest. The life of a society, as of an organism, is independent of the lives of any of its component units, who are severally born, grow, work, reproduce, and die, while the whole body survives, increasing in mass, in completeness of structure, and in functional activity. This view had at once an enormous vogue. It provided the latter-day conviction of belonging to the whole with a more intelligible explanation than that of Hegelian idealism. And after all, how often in the course of centuries has the body politic been compared to a physical body? No scientific truth finds readier admission than one which serves to justify a metaphor to which we are used. 5. Society, a living organism. The truth is that there has never been a time, the case of Menenius Agrippa shows it, when in discussions on society analogies have not been drawn from man's physical body. 
St. Thomas wrote. Any group would break up of which there was none to take good care. And in the same way the body of man, like that of any other animal, would fall to pieces were there not within it a directing force seeking the common good of all its members, as between the members, it is, whether it be the heart or the head, a ruling chief. In every mass of men there must in the same way be a principle of direction. The analogy had on occasion been pushed to great lengths. Forsett, the Englishman, writing in 1606, compared natural and political bodies organ by organ, and Hobbes, it is said, picked up from him many of his ideas. This I doubt, for Hobbes seems to me to have given Leviathan only a shadowy existence, which was but the reflex of the only real life, that of the men composing him. What is certain, however, is that metaphor is always a dangerous servant. On its first appearance it aims but to give a modest illustration to an argument, but in the end it is the master and dominates it. Rouvry and even Rousseau both reason from the structure of the natural body to explain that, which they know to be artificial, of the community. In Rousseau's case, moreover, the power of metaphor over the mind employing it is very apparent. The progress of the natural sciences has since invalidated all analogies, supported as they were by physiological examples, drawn from the human body, the examples were in any case quite irrelevant, firstly because they were based on a wholly erroneous picture of the organism and the organs taken for the purposes of comparison, and secondly, and above all, because any comparison of a society and being with an organism must be with an organism which is much lower in the scale of evolution than man and far less advanced in the twofold process of differentiation and integration. In other words, if societies are living beings, if they form, as Durkheim unhesitatingly suggests, a social series on top of the animal series, then the beings of this new series can only be at a stage of their own development which places them far behind even the lowest mammifers. As set out by Spencer, the hypothesis seemed to reconcile an intellectual propensity of long standing with recent discoveries in the field of science, from this it received a great encouragement. Moreover, by giving an impulsion and a meaning to ethnological researches, it proved itself a fertilizing stream. Do not primitive societies, in their various stages of evolution, give testimony as to the successive stages through which we ourselves must have passed? We shall return to this point of view and see what should be thought of it. What concerns us here, however, are the political conclusions to which the organicist system leads. We find ourselves once more watching the flight of a boomerang, a doctrine formulated with a view to restricting power becomes almost at once an explanation of and justification for power's extension. Spencer was a Victorian Whig, whose creed throughout his literary life was the abridgment of power's sphere of action. He owed much, far more than he was ever willing to admit, to Auguste Comte, but he was exasperated by the conclusions which the latter drew from the process of social differentiation. Comte had said, The degree of intensity of the regulating function, so far from diminishing with the advance of man's evolution, becomes, on the contrary, more and more indispensable. Each day, as a necessary result of the vast subdivision in operation of human labor, each of us, in many respects, automatically rests the very continuance of his own life on a crowd of unknown agents, who could, either by folly or malignity, often seriously affect masses of people. The various particular functions in the social economy, being naturally bound up with an increasing whole, must all tend by degrees to become subject in the end to the general direction of the furthest flung agency in the entire system an agency marked as to character by the incessant action of the whole on the parts. Spencer takes him to task for this forecast. M. Comte's ideal of society is one in which government has developed to the greatest extent, in which functional activities are far more under public regulation than now, in which hierarchical organization with unquestioned authority shall guide everything, in which the individual life shall be subordinated in the greatest degree to the social life. And he opposes to it his own thesis. That form of society towards which we are progressing, I hold to be one in which government will be reduced to the smallest amount possible, and freedom increased to the greatest amount possible, one in which human nature will have become so molded by social discipline into fitness for the social state, that it will need little external restraint, but will be self-restrained one in which the citizen will tolerate no interference with his freedom, save that which maintains the equal freedom of others, one in which the spontaneous cooperation which has developed our industrial system, and is now developing it with increasing rapidity, will produce agencies for the discharge of nearly all social functions, and will leave to the primary governmental agency nothing beyond the function of maintaining those conditions to free action, which make such spontaneous cooperation possible, one in which individual life will thus be pushed to the greatest extent consistent with social life, and in which social life will have no other end than to maintain the completest sphere for individual life. 6. The Problem of Power's Extent and the Organicist Theory in this controversy the problem of power's extent is frankly posed. 
Kant and Spencer agree in seeing in power a product of evolution, an organ, for Spencer a biological organ, for Kant a figurative, whose final cause or end is the coordination of social diversity and the union of the parts. Is it correct that, as society evolves and the organ of government adapts itself to its end, the latter must direct with increasing rigor and in greater detail the actions of the members of society? Or is the contrary true, must it loosen its grip, find fewer occasions for intervening, and abate its exactions? His preconceptions led Spencer to deduce from his organicist hypothesis the conclusion, already latent in his mind, of power's diminution. He deduced it the more eagerly when, after observing in his youth a drop in the curve of power, he saw it in his maturity start to climb again, a movement which in his old age caused him great disquiet. The coincidence of this ascent with the development of democratic institutions furnished sufficient proof that power is not abated by installing the people as sovereign. Spencer had thought to show that such an abatement was in the natural order of evolution and progress. But this vision of society as an organism which he did so much to accredit was to be turned against himself. Huxley, the biologist, could immediately make objection. If the resemblances between the body physiological and the body politic are any indication, not only of what the latter is, and how it has become what it is, but of what it ought to be, and what it is tending to become, I cannot but think that the real force of the analogy is totally opposed to the negative view of state function. It is not for us to determine whether Spencer's or Huxley's interpretation of the political tendencies of the physiological organism was the more correct. What matters is to note that the full adoption of the organicist viewpoint has militated exclusively on the side of justifying and explaining the unlimited growth of the functions and apparatus of government. Lastly, Durkheim, in a work which created in time a school and is an amalgam of Hegelianism and organicism, laid down that the scale and functions of the governmental organ had necessarily to grow with the development of societies, and that the strength of authority was bound to increase by reason of the pressure of feelings shared in common. At a later date he was to go further and claim that even the religious feelings were only the feelings of belonging to society, the obscure premonitions that we are working out a being which is our superior. And in the end he was to assert that, under the names of gods or God, the real object of our adoration has never been other than society. 7. Waterford Towers Mill. We have now passed in review four abstract conceptions, four families of theories, so to speak, of power. Two of them, the theories of sovereignty, explain and justify power by a right which it derives from the sovereign, whether God or the people, and which it may exercise by reason of its legitimacy or due origin. The other two, to which we have given the name of organic theories, explain and justify power by its function or its end, which is to assure the moral and material cohesion of society. In the first two, power appears as a center of command in the midst of a multitude, in the third as a crystallizing fire, or perhaps as a zone of light from which enlightenment spreads, and, lastly, in the fourth as an organ within an organism. In those of sovereignty the right of command is seen as absolute, in the organic the function of command is seen as growing. Different as they are, there is not one of them from which the justification for an absolute form of power cannot be, and at some time or another has not been derived. The two first, however, because they are founded on a nominalist view of society and on the recognition of the individual as the only reality, are somewhat allergic to the complete absorption of man, they allow the idea of subjective rights. Lastly, the first of them all, by implying an immutable divine law, implies also an objective right, the observance of which is imperatively ordained. In the more recent theories, on the other hand, the only objective right there can be is that which society forges and can modify at will, and the only subjective rights are those which it deigns to grant. It looks, then, as if the various theories, viewed historically, broaden down in such a way that they become more and more advantageous to power. A more easily observable phenomenon in each theory is its own evolution. Though in origin their purpose may be to place obstacles in power's path, yet in the end they serve it, whereas the opposite tendency, of a theory advantageous in origin to power becoming its enemy, is quite unknown. The conclusion is, then, that power possesses some mysterious force of attraction by which it can quickly bring to heal even the intellectual systems conceived to hurt it. There we see one of power's attributes. Something it is which endures, something which can produce both physical and moral effects. Can we yet say that we understand its nature? We cannot. Away then with these fine theories which have taught us nothing of the essential, and on to the uncovering of power. Let us try, first of all, to be in at its birth, or at least to intercept it at as near a point as we can to its distant beginnings.